everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our conversation today. Um, my name is Janice Freeman Clark. I am the founding artistic director of Vanguard Theater Company. I know that um, this is a very specific platform that we are talking about today, but I feel like I do need to just mention um, that yesterday, a 20 year old by the name of Dante Wright, um, a black man was killed by an officer during a traffic stop. He was shot in a Minneapolis suburb about 14 miles north of where George Floyd was killed last year. I know again that that is not the topic of today's conversation, but I know that we are all here because we want to end hate um, toward all different ethnic groups. And so um, let's all continue to do that work. And I appreciate you being here today because I know that you want to be a part of the solution to end hate. If you are inspired by the discussion that we have today with JD, uh, we'd love for you to take a moment and donate to the Immigrant History Initiative. They are a small grassroots 501c3 organization working to improve education in schools around immigrant history, including Asian American history. And their website is www.immigranthistory.org. So I'm thrilled today to be in conversation with a friend of mine and a friend of Vanguard's, J.D. Rickafort. Um, before I have him hop on, I want to tell you a little bit about him. So JD is a rapper, actor, dancer, and self-proclaimed nerd <laughs> based in Queens. His music has been featured on Underground Hip Hop Blog and Broadway World, and his solo hip hop act, Super Smack, recently performed at SXSW. He's performed in multiple productions of Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights, winning the Helen Hayes Award for Best Musical in 2018. And he's an alum of the Public Theater's Hashtag Bars Workshop with Raphael Casal and David Diggs. So we at Vanguard know him well because he played Harold Hill in our 2018 production of Music Man, and also that same year, he served as a mentor in our Broadway Buddy Mentorship Cabaret. And he was a fantastic mentor. Please welcome JD, a.k.a. Super Smack. Hey, how's it going, Janice? Good to hey. see you. First of all, thank you for being with us. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to be here. Anything for Vanguard. <laughs> well, you were so sweet. Can I tell you that I have um, directed music man several times and you will always be my all-time favorite Harold Hill. I, just want to <laughs> I know that you do a lot of things um I know that musical theater is one of your loves but you do so many things yes. I'm super super obsessed with your super smack song called <laughs> called choose which is kind of all about how you live your life right yeah. how, you, how you just kind of try new things and when you're ready to move on you just make a new choice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. Talk oh, thank you. a little bit about your music career as Super Smack and what inspired you to start making music and all of that great stuff. Ab absolutely. Um, that's it. That's a really fun question to start with. Um, I also, <laughs> even before uh, we, we fully uh, dive deeper, I really appreciate you opening up the conversation talking about what happened uh, to Dante Wright yesterday. Um, it's incredibly sad, incredibly tragic. Uh, and I just want to make sure that that everyone, I mean, I, I had to take, I had to take time today just to process it. So um, yeah, these, these things absolutely should be given space. And um, I think that, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it later, but I actually think all of these things are really interconnected. And so it is, it is really um, unfortunate. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm glad that we are able to have a discussion today about some things around, around this, uh, because uh, all of these things deserve space in our hearts, in our minds, and thoughts, prayers, and actions. So um, I appreciate you bringing that up, and and I I was definitely uh, hoping to address that at some point. So 
Uh, thank you. Yeah. So I guess uh, what do I, what do I do? I guess I am. Um, uh, sometimes you just start doing things, and then you find out later that those things have a name. And uh, a couple of years ago, I heard the phrase. Uh, actually, it was from uh, originally I heard it from uh, Raphael Casal and David Diggs. Uh, multi hyphenate, and I think that that's pretty appropriate. Uh, the multi hyphenate being, you know, you do many things and they're linked together by a hyphen because they're all contained in one person. So I'm a uh, I'm a pop musician, so recording artist, and I tour and perform, uh, particularly when there's not a pandemic going on. Um, I had just finished up uh, my first solo national tour uh, in uh, fall and winter of 2019, uh, so that was really exciting. So uh, as you mentioned, my solo act is called Super Smack. Uh, I write original music uh, that aims to uplift and inspire people and just bring and share joy. I feel very lucky that I have a lot of joy in my heart, even though um, there's a lot of very challenging and complex things that go on in the world. Um, one of the things that's always just been the case, uh, probably because maybe, you know, how I was raised to, to find joy in things. And I wanted to put that in an art form that I love, which is hip hop and pop music. And, and share that with people. So uh, that, is, that is my music. Uh, people ask me what I sound like, and I, I usually say uh, a mix of Outkast and Limo Mo Miranda, but Asian. Yeah, that's my music. Ah, <laughs> I see that. That's actually yeah. quite accurate. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, let's talk AAPI activism, Asian American and Pacific Islander, for those of you who aren't familiar with the acronym. First off, do you prefer the term, or I guess the phrase, stop AAPI hate over stop Asian hate? And can yeah. you maybe explain the distinction a little bit? Um, sure. I'll start with the, just the distinction between Asian, Asian American, and AAPI. So uh, Asian is anyone who has any, identifies with any sort of roots in the continent of Asia. If you look at Asia on a map or on a globe, it is gigantic. Uh, I think most people in the U.S. think of East Asians, like China and Japan, and I'm just like, I don't know, apologize for anyone, but I think it's always good to go over, oh, like, the history and geography. Um, yeah, but it's interesting, like, if you say Asian in the U.K., there's a very good chance that someone will think you're talking about Indian people or South Asian people. Uh, so my family comes from the Philippines, and that's part of Southeast Asia. There's uh, the Middle East, Central Asia. Uh, a lot of different groups, and um, as with many of these terms that kind of get created artificially, uh, we are not a monolith, and there's so many different kinds of people and rich cultures uh, in the continent of Asia. And then when you think about the diaspora in terms of the people who've spread out into other parts of the world, that all of a sudden gets multiplied like tenfold. And so that brings us to kind of like the, the Asian American experience, and that to me is just anyone who's immigrated uh, you know, either first generation, second generation, their parents, grandparents, fifth generation, whatever it is, uh, to the United States uh, from any Asian country. Um, the term AAPI, I think, has kind of risen over the last few years to acknowledge the fact that in addition to Asia and Asia proper, there's also a ton of islands that are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that are technically part of the Asian continent, uh, but have some overlap with some of the Asian experience, uh, but also don't. So that's uh, the term AAPI, Asian American and Pacific Islander, is inclusive of that, particularly, I think, giving a shout out and spotlight, um, absolutely importantly so, to the indigenous people uh, on these islands, uh, many of whom uh, have had to deal with uh, generations of colonization. Um, so in terms of what I prefer, uh, in terms of like what phrase actually matters, uh, I don't really, I, I, I'm good with either one, stop AAPI hate, stop Asian hate. Um, I think both, I think it's always important to be really inclusive. Uh, and so AAPI is really useful for that. But I also think it's important for things to be accessible. And sometimes acronyms can get a little confusing and um, can sometimes be a little bit of a gateway uh, to people understanding an issue. Uh, so I usually go for stop Asian hate. I think that's the one, especially if we're talking like hashtags and all the silly stuff around social media that we all know is silly, but is actually like very important and affects all our daily lives at this point. Um, like being able to consolidate around certain hashtags is very useful. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say I use stop Asian hate more uh, as like the primary phrase uh, that I 
that I share? Research released early in March revealed that in roughly a year, there were about 3,800 incidents that were reported um, toward um, in, in this Asian hate um, realm. And of course, that's what was reported, right? And so I can only imagine how many actual incidents there were. And I'm curious what, what you are doing to kind of help raise awareness um, for the community and how can we combat this? The rise in hate crimes against Asians and Asian Americans, um, and this actually is, this is something that really, really uh, started to increase with the start of COVID and people uh, mistakenly blaming Asians and scapegoating Asians for, uh, for the pandemic. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that this has actually been going on for generations and generations. Uh, the Chinese, uh, first Chinese to immigrate to America uh, in the early, early 20th century, um, who were, uh, came to America to build the railroads to connect the country in absolutely harsh conditions, uh, because there were very few other groups that were willing to subject themselves to that sort of labor, um, were treated uh, incredibly unfairly and incredibly unequally. So uh, all of that, uh, and then there's just been been generations and generations of different forms of uh, that hate, uh, both systemic and like person to person um, that have taken place. So COVID has kind of like put an uptick on that, um, but it's really been going on and the roots of it are really, really old. So the forces that we have to reckon with are really, really like deeply rooted, um, but it means that we can all be part of the solution. And, it, and, and I think that that is, uh, a nice opportunity there as well. Um, in terms of like what we do, what we do about it, I like to focus on a few different things. Uh, one is talking to folks about history and context. Asian American history is not something that I learned in school. And I was a pretty good student and I like studied everything in the book. And <laughs> I, thought I, I thought everything in the book was everything there was to learn. And so when I got older and I started realizing that there was so much that unfortunately wasn't included in, in like my public school curriculum, uh, that was very, very eye-opening to me. So I think the first things that we can do are to teach and to learn and to understand that we're all coming at this, um, at these issues, not just for Asian American history, but all sorts of ethnic and immigrant uh, history from different uh we're all coming at it from different places. We know different things. We have different perspectives. We've been taught different things. And so we're all on this journey and just sitting in that and being comfortable with that and, and talking to people about that. Specifically, um, I, through uh, the arts organizations that I'm a part of, so I'm part of a freestyle hip hop improv team uh, called North Coast. Uh, and we're like an incredibly uh, multicultural and diverse team. And it was really important to work with my team to put out a statement of solidarity, just as we did last summer uh, with Black Lives Matter um, after the murder of George Floyd uh, on, these, on these topics and to do it before it sort of became trendy to do so. Um, so having these conversations early, being a leader and not just a follower is something that I really encourage uh, everyone here to do because there's always something that you can, that you can teach and, and, and learn from that. I started hearing about these attacks really early on because they were happening to people who were close to me, people who were friends, people who were family. And it was before it was getting mainstream media attention. Um, and I'm someone who like is not always on social media, uh, but whether it's social media, whether it's your personal conversations that you're having with loved ones, um, finding some way to talk about things that are important to you. Uh, culturally, uh, there's uh, a lot of dynamics where sometimes it is seen as noble to um, take the challenges of life uh, and not complain about them too much and just be resilient. And I think there is beauty in that and there's strength in that. And it, that is a very, very wonderful thing. Um, but there's, there are times to, do, to just be the rock and be resilient. And then there's also times to make some noise. And uh, I think right now is a good time to start making noise. 
let's start making some noise. You talked a little bit about Asian American history and I'm with you, JD. I started trying to figure out what did I learn? I couldn't remember one thing. I'm gonna be honest. I couldn't remember one thing that I learned. I started doing my own research and my mind was blown. Things that I didn't even know about, right? Like the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm -hmm. which, by the way, is the first, it remains the only law that was implemented to prevent all members of a specific ethnic or national group from immigrating to the United States. Yep. That blew my mind, right? Yeah. Why don't we know these things? I think we don't know. We don't know for a lot of reasons. Um, I think one of the big things that is a through line in American history are the relations between white people and black people, right? And this is such a predominant force in our history, most of the time, very tragically so, um, that, that, is the, that is a lens through which, especially people who want to be woke and want to understand things better, um, really see American history. And for very, very good reason. I think the challenge to, to everyone is to realize that there are, like American history is, involves a lot of different dynamics. Um, and uh, when, you know, in the, early, in the early days of the census, uh, when they started like keeping track of uh, different ethnic groups in America, uh, the, er, those early forms, just had two boxes you could check. You were white or you were black. Um, <laughs> and so like, if you were Asian or coming from any other country or any other group, like what box did you check? You know what to check. <laughs> and that has been the struggle. I don't know exactly. I, I think it's almost, um, at some point it's less important to really pick apart why and just start fixing the problem. Cause that has been the real, that has been one of the big struggles um, of Asian Americans. Uh, I would say there's, there's three really, really big ones. One is, the objectification of Asian women, the emasculation of Asian men um, culturally, uh, and then the erasure of the Asian American experience. And that last one is really, really harmful and really, really insidious. Uh, because when you start to say like, oh, you know, you're either, you know, one of these two groups, but like, we don't really care if you're something else, um, then that starts to dehumanize a group of people. And when a group of people are dehumanized, then that starts to lead some of the crazier, more aggressive, maybe more mentally unstable, prone to violence people to think that, oh, we can harm these people and it doesn't matter because they're not actually people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is that is the really, really important uh, thing to think about when talking about how important it is to learn and to see these this group of people as, as people with like really rich stories and, and, and really rich histories. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Blacks and Asians actually do have a history, I believe, of being allies for mm -hmm. one another. And then they're kind of reached a point in time um, in the 1960s when Black power movements were really starting to gain mm -hmm. momentum, that politicians were trying to kind of undercut, I guess, the movements and say, Asians have experienced racism in this country, but because of hard work, they've been able to pull themselves up out of racism by their bootstraps and have the American dream. So why can't you? Yeah. So this is like this whole model minority myth, um, which essentially is a tool, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would love for you to chat a little bit more about that. Uh, the model minority myth is is exactly how you how you described, which is like, oh, Asians, we're, we're like the we're like the good people of color. We're like the good immigrants. Like, why can't everyone be like them, or why can't everyone be like us? If you are Asian, because there are Asian there are um, groups of Asians who really kind of identify with this uh, myth, um, as harmful as it is. So uh, that like learning that that is a tool and has been a tool for generations to pit people of different groups of color against each other to the benefit of people in power to preserve that power has been one of the most eye-opening things of like my kind of like 
post school, like adult self education. Um, and I'm really grateful to like a lot of my friends uh, for like kind of being with me on this journey of like learning all of this. Um, yeah, I think that is one of the major and most harmful dynamics uh, between uh, black communities and Asian communities in particular. Yeah. Um, cause it's just a huge misunderstanding and it's a huge, it's a huge miss and it's a huge fail because we have such an opportunity to understand our like common experiences and like, come together and help each other out that, that we have to break that down. We absolutely have to break that down. The other is like dynamic, which is really closely related is like this, like idea that we have to fight for scraps mm -hmm. that like, you know, just put it bluntly, like white people are going to get theirs. They get first pickings. <laughs> like, everyone else has to fight over everything else. Like, I was in a, in a conversation one time with, uh, with a friend who, who was actually really well-meaning and wanted to help address these issues. And they were talking about finite resources. So, oh, there's only so many resources that can go around. So we have to prioritize. And I'm like, that makes sense sometimes when you're, when you're, you know, you know, for very, very specific issues, but like most of the time it, it doesn't actually make sense and it's not the right mentality. And what I was trying to explain to them is like helping the black community achieve equality and justice is only going to make things easier for Asians to do the same and vice versa, and the same for other oppressed groups and the same for other minority groups. Like that is, is all of these things are interconnected. Yes. And, and I think one of the misses actually of like, of even the progressive movement over the last, I would say 10 years and like shout out to that movement because they've really helped like educate a lot of us. But one of the misses has been over-focusing on white versus everybody else. Mm. And the point is not to pit different groups against each other, but to understand that like everyone is capable, like different pe people from different groups are always capable of harming other people. We're all capable of doing harm and we're all capable of loving each other. And there's beauty in that. And so I think we are just starting to get to the point now where people are talking more about intersectionality and cross minority, cross group dynamics and how these things are complicated. And that to me is very exciting because life is really complicated. Yeah. I have some really, really close friends who are black who have been subject to some really harmful acts of racism from Asians. Hmm. I have, uh, I have friends who are Asian who have been subjected to really harsh uh, forms of racism, acts of racism from black people. Um, I'm one of those people. <laughs> like, I've also been subjected to racism from other Asians. <laughs> like sure. it's not just white versus, it's not just, it's literally not just black and white and it's not just all about like white versus everything else. And so I think the more we, we learn to become comfortable living in that kind of nuance and kind of the tricky, the tricky stuff, um, the better off we're, we're, we're just going to be in a much better position to like actually start problem solving. Absolutely. Together, collectively, right? Mm -hmm. so, so how, in your opinion, how do we practice intersectional activism? Mm. One is learning from each other. So I have to give like huge credit to the black activist community and movements over the last 10 years for frankly, teaching a lot of, <laughs> a lot of us, a lot of things. Sure. And I've had my eyes up when I first, I will be like really honest and say like when I first heard the phrase black lives matter, I think it was in 20, 2012 after Trayvon Martin was killed I didn't get it I understood mm. what I understood that this was tragic and this was wrong but I didn't understand there was just so much that I didn't know and I thought that I was like pretty well educated and stuff and so that's what kind of going back to the point of like we are all on a journey we can all help each other on this journey so learning from each other there's just so many techniques and tactics and templates of how to put together movements through how to mobilize people through social media, 
how to put together a protest, how to talk about hard issues, um, how to deal with emotional trauma throughout all of this. There's been a lot of Asian Americans that I know that um, have been going through a lot emotionally and uh, part of it is the incidence of hate and seeing the news. And then the other, the second wave of that is like everyone else reacting to it. And then now all of a sudden you're getting all these texts and messages that are really well-meaning, but can sometimes be really like, it's like a second wave of trauma that happens. And I'm, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I feel like I'm, if I'm preaching, I'm only preaching back because these are all things that I heard about from my black friends last summer. And so when it started to happen to, to my Asian friends and myself <laughs> over the last couple of sure. months, it helped to know that this is something that other people have gone through and different techniques of coping with that and gentle reminders to people who want to help and want to be allies of like, what to, things that are helpful, things that are maybe not so helpful. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm really, I think like learning from each other and taking templates from one each other, uh, from work being done in different communities is really important. The second is also understanding where we're different. There are things that are actually unique and that can't be simply copied and pasted across groups. I'll give you one example, which is after the horrible shootings in Atlanta, um, one of the first things that a lot of us who were really affected by this wanted to do was to find out the names of the victims. Um, you know, say their names has become a really powerful phrase that uh, started within the Black Lives Matter movement and is spreading elsewhere. In some of these cases, though, these, the families or the victims actually didn't want the names to be so public because people mourn differently. There's different cultural dynamics, there's different family dynamics to that. And like, that was just a very sobering moment when, um, you know, I saw some people actually, you know, took down some posts because they had been asked politely by the families to not share the names so publicly, like that not everything can be copied and pasted. And that's totally okay, because we are different. There are things that make us similar, there are things that make us different. Um, so just kind of living in those similarities and differences are things that we can do. And then the third, the third, I think one of the best things that we can do has nothing to do with like activism per se, but it's just like being good to each other, like having fun together doing a musical together, you know, going, I don't know, uh, playing video games together, uh, watching, watching movies, like talking about things that don't have to do with politics and, 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 and race and hard issues and just kind of living, like enjoying the beauty of life together <laughs> with people who are of different backgrounds. That's the thing that's really gonna connect us at the end of the day. Um, another thing that I gotta give, you know, a credit to, to my, my partner for always offering me a, a gentle reminder on is, is as hard as these things are, never let never let anyone take away your joy. Mm. And and even if you're mourning, even if you're angry, even if you're taking action, don't feel guilty about wanting to be happy and doing things that make you happy and doing those things with other people. Um, and so I think yeah, just like being good to each other. <laughs> it sounds so silly, yeah. but it's a really yeah. important thing. No, too. it seems so simple, but. You know, what I love about what you just said, um, as you know, Vanguard's goal, like just as a theater company, is kind of exactly what you said. We just like to bring people together from all these different backgrounds, from different cultures. And we have this common, we share this common love of theater. But then that doesn't mean that we don't get to know one another, that we don't learn from one mm -hmm. another, that we don't break down walls that sometimes are uncomfortable. Um, but we also have this, this joy of celebrating our differences. I love how you said things can't always be copied and pasted. I love that. That is so true, right? The whole goal is for us to learn about one another. And the moment you know more about someone, the less intimidated you are or fearful you are or whatever you're bringing into the room, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I love that you said that. So, th so thanks for saying that. Okay, so this question says, representation of Asian Americans in theater has played a big role in seeding and continuing racism. How can Asian American representation in theater help combat racism and open minds moving forward? 
Vanguard's production of The Music Man was groundbreaking and powerful in its casting. How do we encourage more theater companies to create shows with a more multifaceted lens like this? I think theater companies, especially these days, most theater companies have good intentions and they're trying mm -hmm. um, and they would like to cast as diverse cast as possible. Um, to, so assuming that their intentions are in the right place, the challenge is usually twofold then. The challenge number one is uh, financial. So they still got to sell enough tickets and like stars sell tickets. And so there's this weird, unfortunate self-fulfilling prophecy where like famous people get more jobs. <laughs> it's like, well, famous people get more jobs. How do other people become famous? How do other people even get a chance? <laughs> um, so I think with like musical theater in particular, I think all of us should just be less precious about our shows. There's like something about like, oh, I saw, you know, I don't know. I saw Wicked this way, done this way. And so I can't ever see it done any, any other way. I think like the way that they license, um, I don't know, I'm gonna get weird and like businessy for a second, but I think the way that shows yeah. are licensed is a huge part of the problem, right? Like these mm. publishing companies, they say like, why are there no, you know, community theater or re even regional theater productions of Wicked or Hamilton, right? It's because they are very, very protective of their product. And they're so protective and precious about their intellectual property. That is an outdated business model. I'm sorry, that's an outdated business model. Every other form of media and art is starting to move past that. And musical theater is stuck you know, in the previous century. And they're like, oh, if you're going, you know, we can't let you do a regional theater production of Hamilton because that'll make people buy less tickets to the Broadway production of Hamilton. No, it's totally false. It's totally false. Like a rising tides lift all boats, right? Like I would love to see an all Asian production of Hamilton. I would love to see an all Latinx production of Hamilton. I would love to see an all queer production of Hamilton, you know, or uh, any other show, right? Also like I'm a writer and I am very, very protective of my work, but I also like, we are, we, we are starting to live more and more in a remix culture and musical theater has not caught up to that yet and we are so protective of the book and the text and you can't change anything like no something mm -hmm. has to be changed if there's something like Miss Saigon is a show that I grew up having a lot of respect and reverence for because it it it, it the music was beautiful and you know Leia Salonga was this amazing star there's a lot of really problematic stuff in that show there is and I Right now, our choices are either to do it exactly like all of the white produce, rich white producers want us to do the show, um, or to like cancel the show and never have it done again. Like, like you know that there are tons of people who are would be incredibly capable of like rewriting this show, right? Reimagining it. So, like, why don't we open ourselves up to a little bit of that remix culture, that re reimagining culture, particularly Love in musical it. theater? We have to be less precious about this stuff if we're mm -hmm. going to move forward yeah. yeah and also we need to take a chance on new shows um enough adaptations <laughs> enough redoing a show that was already done 10 years ago um i'll take a chance on new shows take a chance on new writers i'll stop there um <laughs> because i got really excited love it no no no. i'm so <laughs> with you on everything you said thank you for saying it okay so this person says i am a counselor how would you like to see mental health care for AAPI clients improve <sighs> as far as cultural hum humility and competency, specifically when dealing with white mental health care providers? Mm -hmm. What do people get wrong, especially now in the aftermath of the pandemic? Yeah, it's a really good question. I can offer some, some things that I, that I think about. But I think this is gonna. This is probably a time when I need to sort of like take my own seat <laughs> a little bit because I'm not a mental health professional, so I don't want to prescribe anything around that. Yeah. Um, there are lots of, of resources. There was a really cool panel discussion of like Asian American mental health professionals um, that happened on Clubhouse last week. So like this stuff is going on. It's on the internet. A simple Google search will probably take you a very a very long way in finding people who know more about this stuff than I do. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that uh, within the Asian American community, there is a big stigma against uh, mental health uh, um, treatment. Uh, 
not just medicine, but like even like therapy. Yeah. Um, and those are like cultural things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to really uh, encourage people from different and diverse backgrounds to enter into these fields, to give them jobs and to realize that you are not like, <laughs> we're getting to the point now, actually we've probably already been at the point where like race is one of the biggest things that hangs over a lot of people's heads. I know it's one of the things that like, is that one of the heaviest things that I bear on a day-to-day -day basis. So like, how can you really actually offer any real mental health services as an organization, like a school, um, if, you're, if you're not, if you're missing people on your staff that can't talk about these things, um, whether it's having an Asian or another person of color or someone who can just understand the perspective, then you're understaffed. You are missing key skills. It's like not having, you don't have a math teacher. <laughs> you know, like, like that's, we have to start viewing it like that. Yeah. Brilliant. Yes. So agree. Um, how do, this person is asking, how do we address intra-minority racism? Koreans against Chinese, Chinese against Japanese, etc. Mm -hmm. We need to unify to challenge white supremacy. Uh -huh. Yeah, we definitely do. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I think the first is uh, the people who lead those discussions have to be the people in the groups themselves. Um, it, what is not helpful is when someone who is not Asian <laughs> starts talking about Chinese versus Japanese and like, what's going on with that? And like, you should do this or that. Like that's, that's not as helpful because you don't really know unless you're in it. Um, and I know that this is something that um, people from other groups uh, deal with as well. Like um, uh, within the black community, right? There's African-Americans, there's African immigrants, um, which itself has tons of different cultures and countries. Um, and there's uh, Caribbean folk, right? There's like mixed race. There's people of all different shades. And there's colorism within all of that. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I find it like, I, you know, focusing on tackling white, white supremacy is always important. But like when I have a chance to talk about race, I will usually... Uh, not over focus so much on like, just the white supremacy thing because number one we are we all know <laughs> we all know that it's a big problem. Right. Uh, number two, I actually find it weirdly comforting to know that everyone's capable of being racist to other people. <laughs> it like humanizes the whole thing. Um, I go to the Philippines, you know, and I see people hating on Indian people. And it's like what? Like people in America would never understand this, um, but. I think once we understand that it's something that we're, it's a problem that everyone is susceptible to, um, yeah, it just like invites everyone to kind of be part of that, that, that solution. I also know that like, I was listening to an interview with John Cho, um, amazing actor, uh, um, Harold and Kumar is still one, one of the weirdly, surprisingly uh, good <laughs> representation movies for Asian Americans. Um, but uh, he was talking about why the phrase Asian American even came to be a thing. And it was because like Chinese people didn't identify with Japanese people, right? But it was just because they started getting oppressed in the same way. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you explain that like, you know, you have this really unique culture if you're Korean or Filipino or Thai or whatever, but like, as soon as you walk outside the door on the street, you know, you, you turn Chinese because everyone sees you that way. Right. And um, I think the trick, the like, magic puzzle that we need to solve or like what what John Cho said was because pe we were getting pushed we locked elbows and then we became Asian American and I'm starting to see it happen now in a very beautiful way with Asian communities and black communities we're starting to lock elbows the challenge is can we lock elbows even before anyone else gets hurt or assaulted does it have to take a tragedy to unite us can we just unite beforehand? <laughs> That's the trick. That's the trick we have to solve. Yes. That's the trick. So Joanna Carpenter wants to know, can you dig further into, and actually you just kind of spoke about this a little bit, um, into what representation in a positive light specifically looks and sounds like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So 
if I ask someone to represent a human being in a single movie or a single show, it'd be impossible, right? You'd be like, what? That's impossible. So if I ask you or anyone else to represent an Asian American experience in one show, that would also be impossible. <laughs> so the first thing is volume. This is one of those cases where like quantity does help with quality. Like we need different kinds of representation. We can't just have, I would love, like we don't have any lead roles right now. That's why like Vanguard casting me as Harold Hill was amazing. <laughs> I was so grateful to that. Um, but I also don't want a world in which Asians all play leads. Actually, that'd be kind of cool for a little while. But like, <laughs> like we, can, we are not always heroes, right? Oh. We can be villains. We can be side characters. We can be background characters. We can definitely, definitely, definitely be heroes. Um, so different kinds of roles, right? Like cutting away stereotypes is like one thing. Some really, so really like harmful- Normalizing. Normalizing, exactly. Yeah. Another, like some really, really harmful things, I'll go back to um, particular stereotypes in America is um, objectification. So any show now where that shows like, you know, Asian Americans or Asian women as just objects to be desired by uh, someone else with like no agency on their own, um, we need to stop that. We gotta stop that. It's, it's, so, it's so, so harmful and it's not fair and it's not right. Um, for Asian men, the big struggle has been emasculation. So like painting, you know, Asian men as like not objects, as not, as not uh, subjects of a romantic story, right? Um, how many movies have you seen that have like an Asian guy kissing someone? <laughs> it's like a crazy rich Asians and then that's it. <laughs> it's the only movie anyone's ever seen. Um, that's crazy, right? So like we, we have to, like we're capable of falling, falling in love, you know, we're capable of getting into fights. We're capable of of uh, putting on a suit and being in the Avengers. There needs to be a more Asian people in, in the Marvel movies in particular, because uh, I love the Marvel movies. Um, and uh, I think when people think about representation, they always think about like, oh, but you have, you have, you know, this Asian show, or you have, you know, this other thing. And those are great, but like, we don't just need like Asian shows, we need Asian people in black shows. We need Asian people in white shows. We need like different, we need to start well, mixing it up, right? Yeah. Like, and maybe we can get to a point where we don't have to call them black. Yep, yep, right? <laughs> exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. They're just like stories about people. Stories, stories. They're just yeah. stories about people. Okay, we have two more questions. So. Um, this person says, I'm finding that my white friends cannot understand these topics because it is not their lived experience. It is not for lack of empathy, but they are so disconnected to our struggles. How do I explain to them their white privilege in a palatable way so they may move toward allyship beyond a trend or a social media post? Good question. Um, yeah, I see this a lot because there are a lot of people who really want to help and want to empathize and that have the empathy, but they don't have the sympathy, right? They don't have the lived experience. So that's okay. And there are ways that you can help without having to live the entire experience yourself. And there are also ways that you can always, you can relate more, right? Like there's, there's, I was talking to someone, uh, you know, during the Black Lives Matter movements of last summer, who was not black and was just like, I can't imagine what that would be like if that was my son, you know? So maybe there, are, maybe, Maybe they're a, a parent or maybe they are just like find something that is in their lived experience because lived experience does, nothing informs us more, right? It's like find something in that, that lived experience um, to be a touch point into. Um, we're also really capable of 
I'm also really of the opinion that sometimes things take time because I've been on a journey. It's taken me year, a lot of you know years. So like the person might not really get it right away, but if they are trying, if you're helping them, if you're helping them to help themselves, because it shouldn't be on, I'm assuming this person is a person of color. It shouldn't always be on you and your responsibility to educate, right? Like you can encourage, some people have reached out to me to ask questions. If I had the energy, like they said, I don't really get this thing about Asian American dynamic. I want to understand, can you help me? If I have the energy, then I'll answer. If I don't, then I'll say, I appreciate your question and your interest. Um, like there's a lot of resources out there. Um, like I would encourage you to look. And if they really are doing their best, they'll try and they'll, they'll learn. And sometimes these things take time. I know from people who are really close to me, who I've been really proud of for becoming more open-minded over the years and changing their minds. One thing that a lot of people tell me in common is they, a lot of the mind changing doesn't happen in the middle of a heated argument because one person won the argument and so therefore they collect all the chips and now like the person has changed their mind and it's magic. Mm -hmm. It happens in the quiet moments mm -hmm. when they're reflecting on that conversation a week later, a month later, a year later on their own or when, they're ex when they are explaining it to somebody else. So something that I tell people is these things take time and particularly with people who are not people of color. So like not in this case, non-Asian people or white people talk to other non-Asian people about this um, because A, <laughs> um, most Asian people know. So um, I know that your intentions are great, but like, <laughs> so at some point, you know, don't, don't put all the pressure on your Asian friends to explain everything to you. Um, but I encourage them to try talking to other non-Asians about these issues. Because sometimes when we have to explain something, we actually start to understand it better. Mm. And so you might not have understood it 100%, you understood it like 50%, but now all of a sudden you're in a position where you have to explain that to somebody else who understands it 0%. Right. And at the end of that, now you understand it 75%. <laughs> it was a little bit better, so yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so the last question of the night. How do you think the rhetoric in today's politics has affected the public public's attitude toward the AAPI community? Yeah, well, um, the remarks of the previous administration certainly didn't help. <laughs> it was really bad, um, as they were on many things. Um, uh, in I think that our rhetoric and our language around this is like really immature and not well developed yet. Mm. Um, a lot of people are, a lot of people don't even understand the difference between different kinds of Asians or between Asians and Asian Americans. Um, and like, you know, you can, someone gets called out for being racist against Asian Americans and they're like, no, but I, I love Asian people. You know, like I, I, I made a post, a social media post about, and this is again, kind of going outside politics, but I think it's demonstrative of what happens in politics is, um, you know, I said like, oh, we need more Asian American representation in TVs and movies. And a friend of like uh, an acquaintance of mine was like, oh, I, I watch a lot of that, you know, and they listed all of these Asian movies that were like foreign films. And I was like, I had to explain to them why that's different. So basically we're, 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 it's very young, it's very immature and needs to develop better. Um, when it comes to politics, something that I'm really excited about is us finally giving more space to Asian American activists and Asian American politicians, because we do exist. There's quite a few of us. Um, uh, and finally, the media is like listening more. I love um, kind of wonky like public policy discussions. And the, there's a podcast I listen to um, from the organization 538, um, Nate Silver's like political forecasting company. And I really like their podcast, but um, their panel doesn't have any Asian people on it. And when the attacks in Atlanta happened, they had an episode where they brought in an Asian American expert on 
And I didn't end up listening to the whole discussion because I couldn't get past the title that they chose to put on the episode, which was the attacks in Atlanta may activate the Asian American community politically. And I was like, this shows just, you completely missed the issue because we've been activated. <laughs> The difference is not Asian people finally starting to listen and starting to care. And that's just such a, it's such a, uh, a it's such a misunderstanding um, to have that. And so I have had the opportunity to work with some uh, Asian American activists in politics, grassroots organizers. Um, I've gotten to hear uh, some elected officials who are Asian American speak and talk. And I'm really excited about that. I'm really, really excited about Asian Americans who are stepping up to these positions because no one's going to be able to speak for us at the end of the day. We need to speak for ourselves and people need to listen. And so the political rhetoric in today's politics, it is very, very harmful. Um, but we need to change that rhetoric by listening to Asian Americans. I'm really excited that uh, the vice president is mixed race and has a uh, South Asian mother, and that's a huge part of her lived experience. Um, that's really exciting. We need we need more of that, and we need to 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 listen to people, um, particularly in politics, but everywhere else as well, um, who do have this experience, because that's that's where the rhetoric is really going to get smarter and really level up. Um, yeah, yeah. JD, I want to respect your time. I could actually talk to you for the entire night. <laughs> are and how engaging you are but I want to respect your time I want to thank you so much for chatting with us um, I think we've all learned so much from you I think there are a lot of new JD fans and so I want you to let <laughs> people know where they can find you where can they find you oh thank you thank you um, the best and like most accessible place you can find me is on Instagram if you use Instagram um, so I'm at Super Smack Raps. Um, if someone could put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, at Super Smack Raps. If you want to listen to my music, um, which is uh, one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, go to Spotify. So good. Everyone is so good. <laughs> so good. Uh, so good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> go to Spotify or YouTube um, or uh, Apple or wherever you listen to music and just search for Super Smack um, and you'll find my music. And uh, uh, if uh, you just want to connect directly, um, you can always email me to um, my email address is smack at supersmackraps.com. Um, and that's also my website, supersmackraps.com. So you can basically find me anywhere. Just search for Super Smack. Um, thank you, Jessica. It's all in the chat. So um, I, I like talking to people. Um, I like connecting with people. Um, so feel free to reach out. Uh, also, 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 if you enjoyed the conversation today or learned something or just want to help, in addition to all the things we talked about, talking about these things to people in your close networks. Um, you can also take action by donating to a number of great organizations, which you're welcome to do your own research on. Um, the one that we've selected today to spotlight is uh, the Immigrant History Initiative. And I really wanted to spotlight this organization because I've done fundraisers for a lot of different organizations. This is the smallest one that I've done a fundraiser for. Um, so like literally if you can donate a dollar, they will feel that difference. They are that grassroots of an organization. Um, so go to their website, uh, Immigrant History Initiative, and uh, please consider donating. They're doing amazing work to address um, the root of a lot of these problems, which is in our education. Um, so yeah, I'm a big, 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 big fan of theirs. Amazing. Thank you, JD. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Janice. This was, we appreciate you. this is amazing and wonderful. And I appreciate uh, everything that you do and, um, and um, everything Vanguard Theater Company represents and stands for. We have a couple things coming up and we would love your support. So we are a part of the Stages Festival with New Jersey Theater Alliance. And early on in June, the first week in June, we are premiering Songs for a New World. It's an art film of sorts. It puts a new spin on a lot of these songs that have been around for over 20 years, written by Jason Robert Brown. Um, but we've kind of looked at them with a new lens. And that's what Vanguard does. It's all about changing the narrative. Um, in addition to that, we have a couple summer camps coming up. If you have children, 
um, between the ages of seven and 18. We have two fantastic camps. One is going to be in our space. We have a new space. We have a new space. And our theater opening is actually going to be on June 5th. So we'll send out some more information about that if you're interested in joining us. Um, and then our summer camps, like I said, one camp for our younger students between second grade and I want to say sixth grade will be happening in our space in July. And then we have a sleepaway camp that will be happening from July 25th to August 15th um, here in New Jersey, New Milford, New Jersey, a beautiful campsite where we will be able to go and make fantastic art together. So am I forgetting anything, Jessica? No, I think you're good. I, I do want to say that we were able to offer this free of charge um, because of very generous grants we've gotten from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the New Jersey Arts and Culture Relief Fund. And of course, all of our very generous donors who support our work and our mission of dream, diversity, reciprocity, education, activism, and mentorship. Amazing. Thank you all so much for joining us. Till next time.